you got 5,000 random approximations that are not the actual good approximations. And I showed you that the sum of squared errors is always bigger when you take a random approximation compared to when you take the true approximation find, found by the GLM. In other words, the GLM finds always the best approximation given your predictors. In other words, it really minimizes the sum of squared errors. You can't get a smaller sum of squared errors with your predictors. It finds the minimal one. OK. Um, so we find betas. We learned how to find them now. We get them with the regress function. And now the question is, is the beta for sentences, which is the res increasing response when you read sentences, bigger than the beta for not words? OK. So we compute a t value like before. We just take a difference between the two betas. And we divide it by, by some measure of the error. And this measure is like very, very ugly, so I'm not showing it to you. But it's based on the SSE. It's the SSE times some other things. Um, and again, like we saw in the beginning, we end up with a t-test, just like we started, with explained variations divided by unexplained variations. It just took us a longer time to get to that t-test. So we started with this t-test that didn't really work, right? With the t-test of average of the red dots and average of the blue dots divided by the noise. That really didn't work. Um, but then when we, we take the same voxel, the signal from the same voxel that I took from the language system, and we have the design matrix with 11 predictors, including our two predictors that interest us, the beta for sentences is 0.4. The beta for non-words is 0.2. This is the SSE. And when you plug all that into the t value, you get a t value that is highly unlikely to get due to chance. This is not a t value that you can get at random. This t value is very significant, meaning that that difference is real between the beta for sentences and beta for non-words. We believe this difference. That is a voxel that really responds more to sentences than to non-words, which makes sense because I stole it from the language system. OK, um, just a new term for you to know. A comparison of beta weights is called a contrast, because um, we contrast beta weights. Formally, the way you write a contrast, if you ever use uh, softwares that are designed to process fMRI data, you'll see this. It's a vector indicating which beta weights we're testing. For example, we're, in this case, asking whether the beta for sentences is bigger than the beta for non-words. Or in other words, we're asking whether the beta for sentences minus beta for non-words is bigger than 0, which means we want to multiply this plus by 1 and multiply this by minus 1. So we write a vector saying we don't care about the first predictor. We don't care about the predictors from 4 onward. We want to take the second predictor minus the third predictor. And that's our contrast. OK. Um, you can compare one set of beta weights to another set of beta weights. For example, I don't know, let's say for some reason you cared about whether the three betas for head rotation or head translation are bigger than the three betas for head um, translation. Or let's say that you ran the experiment twice, like you will have in one of your exercises. You ran the same experiment twice, so you have a beta for sentences in the first experiment and a beta for sentences in the second experiment. And then a beta for non-words in the first experiment and a beta for non-words in the second experiment. And you want to test whether the two betas for sentences are bigger than the two betas for non-words. You can do that. You can compare um, sets of betas. The way you do this is just make sure that the sum of all the positive entries, not entires, the sum of all positive entries should be 1. And the sum of all negative entries should be minus 1. So for example, I'll use the board. Um, let's say that I have beta 1, beta 2. I should write it there, or can you see this? Can you see this? Beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, beta 4. beta 2 minus half beta 3 
minus half beta 4 bigger than 0, which is like asking whether these two are bigger than these two. Do you all see that? OK. You can also compare just a single beta weight to 0. So for example, you can ask in a given voxel whether the response to sentences beta 2 is bigger than baseline, or like just bigger um, than 0 whether there is any increase to the for the response to sentences. That's it. You don't care about non-words. You can do that. Then you just put one number in the vector. Then I will just have, if I'm interested in beta 2, I will have 1 here and zeros everywhere else. You can do that. Um, so you can define contrasts in many different ways. Usually you'll see just two contrasts, but you can do other things. OK, so in order to run a GLM, this is what we do. We extract the signal time series from a voxel. You know how to do that, right? You've done that in one of the earlier exercises. You run a GLM with the regress command. Um, so you give, it, you give the re regress command the signal and your design matrix with all the predictors. And you find the beta weights that best approximate the signal. And then you compute the sum of squared errors to see how good your approximation really is. You define your contrast and, not A, you define your contrast and test it. Um, so in this case, we care about beta for sentences minus beta for non-words. That's the nominator. And we divide by some measure of the error, something that we do with the SSC. And you repeat that for all voxels. You do that voxel by voxel. For each voxel, you find the two betas. Significant voxels are those that have t values that are not random, that are highly unlikely to get by chance. t values that are very, very, very big. And when you do that, this is what you get. So this is your language system, or this is the, the participant whose brain I showed you, um, language system. Um, you get a, a big strip in the temporal lobe. Um, if you've taken interest in psychology, you've probably heard about Wernicke's area. Um, people that have lesions in this region have trouble understanding what you're saying to them. And they speak very fluently, but everything they say is gibberish. And they're not even aware of the fact that they speak gibberish. You also get some regions in the frontal lobe. Um, for example, you've heard, you might have heard of Broca's region. If you get a lesion in Broca's region, you get Broca's aphasia. These are people um, who have a hard time talking. They can understand most of what you tell them, especially if it's not very complex. But they have a very hard time speaking. They, they stutter a lot. They usually use only nouns and verbs, and they omit wor function words like the, a, on, stuff like that. They just don't use them. And they know that they have a problem. Unlike the Wernicke's aphasics, Broca's aphasics know they have a problem, so a lot of them have depression. Um, you also get regions in the right hemisphere. You've all heard that language is localized or is dominated in the, it's left dominant. Um, most of the language regions or the strongest activations are in the left hemisphere. But we also have regions in the right hemisphere. We're not really sure what they're doing, but they, we think they do something with the non-literal aspects of language. So your tone of voice and what emotion it delivers, jokes, sarcasm, metaphors, any time where you have to understand something from the non-literal meaning of language. Um, OK. You can also use the same data set to ask other questions if you define other contrasts. For example, you can ask which regions in the brain respond more strongly to non-words than to sentences. So in this, way, so your in this case, your contrast will be opposite. You'll have 1 for the non-words regressor and minus 1 for the sentence regressor. And you get this system. This is the IQ or intelligence or uh, cognitive control system. That system uh, responds more to non-words than to sentences. And the reason is very simple. It's harder to read non-words. It's very, very simple to read sentences. It's natural to us. You don't need a lot of cognitive juice for that. But when you try reading non-words that you've never seen before, you need some cognitive juice. So this attention network or this cognitive control network uh, increases its activity more. You can also ask just which regions respond to sentences simply. So you have a contrast with just one number, 1 for the beta for sentences. Everything else is zeros. And you get the same map that we started with. You remember at the very beginning, before we had non-words, I told you, let's see what parts of the brain respond to sentences. And that's what we got. The language system here and here, plus some of the, of the cognitive control system, plus visual, syst uh, visual regions. So you can also do that. OK. Um, you have two exercises left. Yes, question. Sorry. Oh. I was just going to wonder why some areas were left and others didn't, like the one on the left. Where? The 
Oops. Um, the frontal, the frontal. Oh, here? Yeah. That didn't light up here? Okay, okay, because that, that uh, involves like, like okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so you have two more exercises. One, if th one of them has no code. It's just defining contrast, so putting the zeros and ones or 0.5 and stuff like that. That's easy, um, hopefully. And the other one, um, I guess it's not on this slide, it's on the next slide. The last exercise that I guess you'll do at home, um, if you want, you don't have to because no one will test it, but it's really fun, is running a full GLM. And it only takes, it's a very simplified version. We're not using that version in the lab. We have a software that someone developed that does some more fancy stuff. But basically, you can run GLM in MATLAB with 12 lines of code. Um, especially for experiments that get really strong activations like this one. And the nice thing about that exercise is that all of the things you need for that exercise you've already done in previous exercises. And your instructions for that exercise will tell you exactly in what exercise you've already done that. So you can just steal your answers from before and write a GLM. And what you will get is pictures of the brains with red uh, and yellow regions of activations. Um, and you have a lot of information about different voxels in the brain um, in that exercise. But before that, just to make sure we all sort of understand what we covered today. So don't say it out loud. Think to yourself, what, how do we call a mock signal indicating the expected change in brain activity throughout the experiment caused by some hypothesized process? So for example, a mock signal indicating the expected change due to sentences, or a mock signal indicating the expected change due to non-words. So hopefully you all know that we call this a predictor or a regressor. Um, beta weight. Beta weight is a weight indicating what? Think about that. If you know that, then I've done my job here. So a beta weight indicates how much a predictor contributes to the true bold signal or how much the signal changes because of the hypothesized process. So a beta for sentences means how, or tells you how much the signal increases from baseline when you read sentences. Um, holding everything else constant, assuming that you don't do anything else in the same time. You don't also read non-words at the same time. Error is the difference between the true bold signal and what? Think about that. Hopefully you know that. So it's the difference between the bold signal and the combination of predictors that gives the best approximation. Um, and these are changes or variations in the true signal that we cannot explain with the predictors. This is the unexplained variance. How do we call the difference between two betas or two groups of betas? That's the last thing we talked about. Called it a contrast. And then a contrast T value is a number which results from dividing the contrast value by a measure of what? A measure of error. Um, OK. And finally, just to remind you, the GLM, what it does it is, is it um, models the bold signal with um, a product of your design matrix with your that contains your predictors with the beta weights plus some error, or explained variations plus unexplained variations, or task-related activity changes plus some noise that you couldn't predict. That's all. I hope that at this point this is intuitive to you and you have some intuitive understanding of why this is the right way to analyze fMRI data and what those numbers mean and where they come from, um, and that you also have some experience in working with them in MATLAB. Um, I think that's it. Yes, so that's the final exercise of putting it all together that you can start doing now, even though it's 5 to 10, so you probably just want to go home, so you can go home and do it at home. Um, and that's it. If you have any questions, I'll give Nancy my email. Oh, actually, I emailed all of you, so you all have my email. Um, send, me, send me questions. Um, I will send Nancy the slides so that you can have them if you want them. Um, and I'll try keeping the course site open. I think I defined the course time until 10 p.m. today, so it might not be available when you go back home, but I'll reopen it so that it's visible. If you try getting it and it's invisible, just email me and I'll fix it. That's it. Have fun. Um, Nancy, we'll see you next week.